No more deferments. Joseph Schooling and Kwa Cheng Wen will enlist for national service. Individuals are advised to avoid strenuous activity for two weeks after vaccination instead of one. And a seriously injured bus passenger has died eight days after falling over when the driver slammed on the brakes. Welcome to The Big Story, live in The Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Quay. You can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. National swimmers Joseph Schooling and Kwa Cheng Wen will be enlisting for national service soon as their long-term deferments have not been extended. The Ministry of Defence said today that the enlistment process for both men recommenced from August 31st when their deferments ended. Sports correspondent Sazali Abdul Aziz is here to discuss this. Sazali, what did Schooling and Kwa have to say about this confirmation that their deferments will not be extended? I think uh, both have taken taken it in their stride. Uh, you know, they both said in the immediate aftermath of their races in Tokyo that they were keen uh, on training and racing in 2022 when a lot of major competitions are scheduled for. Uh, but a part of them, I think, knew they had KPIs to meet uh, in order to get their extension for deferment. And their times in Tokyo simply uh, were dif too difficult to, to, to support that. So I think they were mentally prepared. Um, and, you know, in their statements, they, they, they said they were both grateful to, to all the support that they received from the government, uh, from MINDEF, from uh, the MCCY uh, over the years and, and throughout their first two deferments. Uh, but the most clear thing, though, is that they, they have uh, indicated they still want to swim and still want to represent the country at the highest level. That has not changed. Well, Sazali, we've had many male athletes serving NS and then going on to pursue their sporting ambitions. Irfan and Iksan Fandi, for instance. But in Schooling and Kwa's case, how much would their training be affected by this? Uh, it's quite hard to say. Uh, male athletes have completed their national service commitments and gone on to compete at the Olympics. Uh, and in some cases, post some very good results. Uh, Loki and Yu's win over Lin Tan in badminton comes to mind. Uh, but there is a very telling statistic. Uh, no Singaporean male has reached an Olympic final or placed in the top eight after completing NS first. So, We'll see if that can change with uh, Joe and uh, Tseng in, in Paris 2024, perhaps. Mm. Well, Sazali, you alluded to, you know, big events that um, both swimmers will be scheduled for next year. For example, the World Championships in May, Commonwealth Games in July and Asian Games in August. But does their NS enlistment essentially rule them out of competing at this event entirely? You know, I, I don't think so. Uh, we were not given an exact timeline of when the two might enlist, but uh, given that the Commonwealth Games and the Asian Games are uh, slated for the second half of the year, that might be enough time for them to train again uh, in, in at the elite level after complete after completing basic mm. training. Uh, the World Championships in Japan, though, I think that might be too soon for them in May. Okay, then how about the Paris Olympics in 2024? Will serving NS leave schooling and qual with essentially not just a year of training and competition momentum? I mean, again, it, it's too early to say, but uh, Zeng at least has confirmed that you know he is uh, working toward Paris. You know, so despite the challenges that are, are in this way, you know, with, with terms of the time constraints, like you said, and and you know potentially not being able to. Uh, pick or, or compete in the competitions that he wants, he is determined to get there. For Joe, it's a bit, a bit less clear. He has, in various interviews, suggested that Tokyo uh, might have been his last Olympics, uh, but he's definitely uh, determined to compete at the highest level for Singapore, be it at the World Championships or, or the Asian Games or other major meets. Uh, but he did reiterate that his main focus uh, is on the here and now, the present, and, and doing what he has to you know, enlisting for national service while juggling his training, uh, you know, for swimming as well. So uh, we'll have to see whether, you know, two of them uh, might still be in action in Paris 2024. OK, well, a waiting game indeed. Sazali, thank you so much for coming on the show today. That was a sports correspondent for The Straits Times, Sazali Abdulaziz.
After being shut for over three days, Chinatown Complex has reopened, but most stalls are still shuttered with hardly any patrons. Housing 700 stalls, the premises were closed for cleaning and disinfection after 66 COVID-19 cases were linked to a cluster there. While the usual bustling food centre was a ghost town when the Straits Times visited this morning, out of 260 food stalls, only around 10 were open for business and hardly anyone was dining in, as you can can see. Well, the few stall holders who spoke to my colleagues said there was an 80 to 90 percent drop in footfall and the most quiet it has been since the circuit breaker last year. Last night, the Health Ministry reported two more nursing home clusters, Orange Valley Nursing Home in Simei and Jamia Nursing Home in West Coast Drive have 13 cases each. Meanwhile, one new case was added to the cluster at All Saints Home, taking its total to 12 cases, while Ren Si Nursing Home had three new cases and now has 32. And although it reopened today, Chinatown Complex saw an additional 11 cases, with a total now at 197. Singapore's expert committee on COVID-19 vaccination now says that those vaccinated, particularly if they are young, should avoid strenuous physical activity for two weeks after receiving their mRNA vaccine instead of its previous recommendation of one week. Well, this follows further research into reports of cases that developed myocarditis or pericarditis within the second week post-jab. Meanwhile, the committee also recommended that those who developed delayed non-severe skin reactions or had non-specific skin symptoms after receiving an mRNA vaccine may be suitable to receive subsequent doses of the same shot. As at August 31st, there have been 90 reports of suspected adverse reactions here to the Sinovac vaccine, including five serious cases. For suspected cases, authorities say this amounts to a rate of 0.053% of all Sinovac doses administered in Singapore and about 0.003% for serious ones. Meanwhile, according to Moderna, new trial data shows that the protection its vaccine offers declines over time, supporting the case for booster shots. The data is showing that for people who got jabbed about 13 months ago, they had higher rates of infection compared with those vaccinated roughly eight months ago. It should be noted that this study has yet to be peer-reviewed. Booster shots were also discussed among Singapore's infectious diseases experts in a Straits Times panel. Our senior health correspondent asking the question, how necessary are boosters if I am not above 60 years old or immunocompromised? The answer to the booster shot is, is that actually there's no hard evidence that that does any good at this point in time. I think at some point we will all need booster shots, without a doubt. This is a question of when. The only evidence that seemed to point towards a third dose, dose being uh, advantageous is in the immunocompromised. Um, that one, the evidence is clear. Even with Israel having now uh, introduced a third dose and seeing a decline in the hospitalization rate of the seniors, I mean, I've seen arguments whether how that data is actually presented and how that uh, is interpreted. Uh, so to, to me, it, it, you know, the, the, the evidence is not as strong. But Having said that, I think there's no harm in vaccinating uh, above 60 years old if we want to proceed. I'd be a bit worried if we push this down, the age group, to the young adults because I don't think that not only do they, does it, would it do any good, it probably will do harm Why at not? this point in time. Because already the second dose gave quite a lot of side effects. I'm not sure what the third dose is going to more, do. More amongst younger people yes. or across all age groups? Amongst younger people. Amongst younger people. I think the older adults don't react too much to this vaccine. Right. And, uh, and we're doing some research to try and understand why that is so, and I think we'll get insights, you know, hopefully uh, in the near future. Um, so, so in terms of the, the benefit of boosters, I think, you know, if we, if we have the vaccines and we want to give it, and, and this is what the policy is, I think there's no harm. But, but trying to push this to the young adults is a different story. 
Professor Wee Eng Yong there from Duke NUS Medical School. Well, he's one of three experts on this panel, joined by NCID's Executive Director, Professor Liu Yi Sin, as well as Professor Su Liang from NUS's Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health. You can watch the panel tomorrow night at 7 p.m. on the Straits Times' website, Facebook and YouTube. The elderly bus passenger seriously injured last week after falling when the driver applied the emergency brakes died this morning after fighting for his life in ICU. 68-year-old Xia Kyok Tiang suffered injuries to his head as well as multiple fractures. The fractures, which included those at his ribs, left him with punctured lungs. The inquiry committee into the Tuas explosion in February that killed three workers will hold public hearings from Monday, September 20th. The first set of hearings will focus on the causes and circumstances of the accident. The Manpower Ministry said it has investigated the accident and a team of state councils will present the findings at the hearings. Which the public can attend on these dates. A second tranche of public hearings will be held from November 15th to 19th to review recommendations to prevent the recurrence of such accidents. The online citizen website and its social media channels were taken offline this morning ahead of a 3pm deadline. This week, IMDA suspended TOC's class licence after it repeatedly failed to declare all its funding sources. Visiting the website now returns an access denied error, with it also not accessible outside Singapore. Its Facebook and Twitter profiles are deactivated, its Instagram is now private, and its YouTube content delisted. The Straits Times has contacted TOC for comment. Overseas, China has criticised the new US-UK-Australia security partnership, saying that countries should shake off their Cold War mentality and ideological prejudice. Well, that's in response to the US, UK and Australia announcing that they'll be deepening cooperation on defence capabilities against what's seen as the threat of a rising China. The move will involve Australia upgrading its submarines to a nuclear-powered fleet. Our Australia correspondent, Jonathan Pullman, with more. I think Australia has done this because it is increasingly concerned about the growing competition in Asia, growing rivalry between US and China, and its own concerns about China. Australia has been the brunt of um, economic sanctions and coercion from China. Relations between Australia and China have not been good. So Australia um, is particularly concerned to bolster its defences um, and it also needs a new submarine fleet um, and so it uh, has been considering it was about to go ahead with the purchase of a, a French fleet for $90 billion deal, a huge deal which has now dropped um, because it's seen an opportunity to, to improve on that with this um, opportunity for nuclear submarines, which is a huge development for Australia and something that had not really been seriously contemplated before. Um, so I think Australia is very worried about tensions in the region and about competition with China and its own relations with China. Um, but it's also looking for an opportunity to bolster its defences and also develop closer ties with its main allies the US and the UK, um, and it's now really doubling down on that alliance um, following this quite unexpected and quite dramatic announcement that Australians are really um, just starting to come to terms with today. Making history on Wednesday night, four private citizens blasted off on a SpaceX rocket ship. It's the first chartered passenger flight with a crew that has zero professional astronauts. They will circle the Earth for three days before heading back. And it's that time of the year again for the Guinness World Records. Appearing in the 2022 edition is this black and tan hound who holds the record for the longest ears on a dog at 34 centimetres each. And this woman who holds the record for the most skips over a person's own hair in 30 seconds. She achieved 60 skips in that time span.
We're going to review one of the most anticipated movies of the year. Dune is out in our cinemas from today. It boasts a star-studded cast like Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson. Well, our very own A-lister film correspondent Don Louis is here to share more on Dune. So Don, it's not the first time it's being made for the big screen with David Lynch doing it in 1984. That was not well received at all. So how was this adaptation for you? Yeah, go to YouTube, you'll find the 1984 version. You'll see that um, David Lynch, who's like an Oscar-winning director, went big on what he likes and which is body horror and kind of grossness. And also the story structure was all over the place. And the thing about Dune is that what David Lynch didn't quite get was that it's a complicated complex world. It's basically a socio-economic story about a bunch of imperial families fighting for control of a planet. So politics, military, and the setup is very important. And this version, Dune, gets it right. In fact, it is two hours plus and a lot of it is just setting up and making sure that people understand what's going on without the text crawls. Remember the infamous text crawls of Star Wars, Phantom Menace he was like reading a bloody politics history book. And in the end, you still couldn't get it. So the setup, the world building is very important. And this film uh, from director Denis Villeneuve gets it right. Right. So exactly, let's build on that point, John. You know, like you said, the first film really has the very difficult task of uh, introducing the universe, the characters and everything, especially for people like me who have never even read the book. So can you tell us more about, you know, in the ways in which Dune managed to set everything up? Yeah, it assumes that you haven't read the book. I haven't read the book and I still found it um, quite clear. And it's more complex than just warring families because there are factions within uh, the families and there are with their religious orders which are bound to do some things and not so it's like a chessboard and certain pieces can only move in certain ways uh, you know it's like game of thrones they had a whole season uh, to to point out who's who and who belongs to what family and what they like so um it's a very admirable job it's a very tough job and and denis villeneuve manages to get it right while providing a bunch of entertainment, a bunch of action. Well, thanks as always, John. That was film correspondent John Louis Dune opens in Singapore today. Never mind the fictionalized, futuristic, sandy landscape of Dune, we can't even explore other countries that are right here in this world. Well, so if you can't fly, airplane spotting is the next best thing. And that's what aviation enthusiasts told our travel correspondent, Clara Locke. So Clara, Life Picks, as you know, is all about you guys giving ideas on what to do on an off day or a weekend. What do I need to take note of to prepare for a plane spotting venture? Two places that are really popular among enthusiasts are Changi Business Park and Changi Beach Park. And they like to go either early in the morning at sunrise or closer to sunset at maybe about 4 or 5 p.m. when the light overhead is not so harsh and you can get like nice blue skies and it's better for photography. Photography wise, you don't need a super pro camera, although you do see a lot of people with telephoto lenses. You can also use a point and shoot or you can get great pics with your phone. And I think it's really nice to, um, for you know, for non plane spotting enthusiasts, it's nice to just go there with a picnic and hang out with friends and share the memories that you associate with flying. Because I think, you know, we see a scoop plane and we think about short weekend trips that we used to take to Bangkok or Bali, or we see an SQ plane and then, you know, it reminds us maybe of the first time we flew Singapore Airlines or a long haul flight that we did to Europe or the States. So there's that reminiscing aspect of it that I think is nice for the lay person. And to find out which planes are coming in, you know, they use Flight Radar 24, which is this um, website that tracks commercial aircraft around the world. So from there, you can see the types of planes, the make and the model, and sometimes the photo as well of the aircraft that are coming into Singapore. So it's nice to look at it on your phone and then look at the sky and see if you can spot something similar. 
Well, thanks for that, Clara. Plane spotting. Do give that one a shot. And before I go, a quick check with food correspondent Eunice Quek on three hot pot hotspots new to town and could heat up the competition with Haiti Lao and Beauty in the Pot. So Eunice, I understand you have three mentions. Budaka in Geylang, Mot Hai Bayo also in Geylang and Mrs. Fur House in Takashimaya. So what's available at these places? Let's start first with um, Budaka, which is said to be the world's first um, Indian hot pot and grill. And basically what that means is that uh, you get like Indian spices that are used um, for like the meat marinades, um, to make the broth as well as the dipping sauces. So let's say for example, um, it's crab broth. Um, it's inspired by the South Indian dish um, crab rasam. Then you have um, the other two, which are Vietnamese ones. Um, Mot Hai Ba Yo, if I got that correct, in Geylang, um, offers some interesting ingredients um, in their hot pot. Um, they have one with fried frog, um, duck, which is an off menu item, and um, Vietnamese mud fish. And so each set comes with fresh vegetables um, and bihun for you know, a nice meal. Um, and I highly recommend that you also add on um, other barbecue items um, like their uh, grilled seafood and uh, meat skewers. And then at Mrs. Fur House, um, they also have some interesting uh, soups. Um, they have, uh, you can try like their crab bisque um, for the hot pot as well as a perilla mutton soup. Um, and they also have other dishes, uh, cooked food dishes like the five spice um, butter quail and uh, lemongrass chicken in clay pot. Um, I think what's interesting with this um, recent crop of um, hot pot places, um, aside from them having you know, very interesting ingredients, they may not be very common. Um, they also pay more attention to the cooked food items, which I do think is a very good uh, plan B um, if they ever need to focus more on deliveries or takeaways. Very yummy. Thank you so much, Eunice. More details in her piece in the Sunday Times this weekend and even more live pics in the Friday pages in tomorrow's paper. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com. I'm Olivia Kui. Join me tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.